Yes, people, Ricky here from Behind the Bars TV. Today's guest is Leroy Smith. Leroy, would you just like to introduce yourself? Hi, guys. My name is Leroy Smith, ex-offender and author, actor, mentor, author of Out of the Box book, mentor to young people, and public speaker, publisher. So me and Leroy met each other in here, I think it was about 2006, and Frank and we were both serving time. Um, that's when, were you start writing your book then, Leroy? Nah, 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 nah. I was still running around like a lunatic then, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously yeah. in Frank and I knew you as a schema. Do you still get called that now or not? Yeah, no, not at all. That name's <laughs> dead. Was that just yeah. your road name? That was a street name. It's finished street and done. Name. <laughs> he, he schema died on the streets. <laughs> so, Leroy, where, um, where were you born and where did you grow up? So, basically, I was born in South London and I grew up in Clapham, South London. Uh, yeah, from, from I was born in St. Thomas's Hospital and I grew up in, yeah, as I said, Clapham, South London, right up until my teens. And what was that neighbourhood like that you grew up in? Was it a rough neighbourhood? Was it like a ghetto type? Yeah, South London. South London's always been a, 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 a graveyard for champions. And it's a rough place, you get me. And basically, most of the people, when, when it was my time, all of the people what was had all the nice things were armed robbers. They used to rob post offices and stuff like that back then. And those were all the top people. And those are the people what everyone would look up to, if anything. Yeah. So who did you live with when you were growing up then, when you were a kid? So basically, I grew up with my gran. My mum got murdered when I was two. So I, I, my gran grew me up from two years old. And all of my aunties and uncles. So we all lived in a, in a house, a big house in Clapham. And they was, they just grew me up. Yeah. Did you live with your mum before she got murdered? Yeah, she was living in the same house with all of us. Right, so you all lived together, yeah? Yeah, it was a family house. And then she got murdered. And then I just stayed in the same house with my rest, with the rest of the family. And just then when I got to a certain age, they took me to... I went to court and I got... My grand got custody of me. And then I just lived with my grand. What about the father? Still... Did you ever have a father figure in your life? No, my grand's still alive now. She's 104 now, you know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go and see her today. So basically, my dad wasn't about... Uh, He was a, like electrician and he was getting on with his own thing. He never really... He didn't uh, embrace me in his own circle. So he, he got a shop opened like got successful as an electrician and started buying houses and that and then he got married and I had had four other kids so they all lived together in Wembley and I lived in South London with my So grandma. from that young age did you know that your mother had been murdered? Yeah, 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 yeah. I knew from when it happened because the police yeah. came and I went to the funeral and uh, you know where they keep bodies before they bury them and all that so yeah. I saw everything get me maybe not the best thing to do bring kids to that them kind of environments because you don't know what it might do to them it might make them have adverse effects so that must have had a massive impact on you that had value yeah, uh, adverse effects yeah adverse effects definitely so what age did you start getting into trouble <clears throat> from about 13 even younger because I'd steal things, petty things, just like a couple of pound on the side to go buy sweets, you understand? Or stupidness, yeah. or a drink, or something that weren't supposed to be touched, and then swear it's not me, <laughs> you understand? <laughs> I really had that, I've done the same. Yeah, I, yeah that's what I used to be like when I, was, yeah. when I was pretty young. And then when I get onto the streets now, we used to, like, back then, when you're 13, a ten pound draw of weed could last you for two days, and you'd be you'd be messed up because it's like 
a lot of weed for ten pound back then. <laughs> I can remember. Buy, back then, you could buy a five pound draw. You could buy a three pound draw. You understand? <laughs> the ten pound you could imagine is a lot. So when you go and get ten pound between you and your friends, and then you're the man because you got all of the weed and everyone's gonna be in that little circle having fun, laughing and joking and just basically we took life for a joke because if yeah. I had known what I know now. I would never be doing that. I would have been at school yeah. and I would have been fixing to be a barrister or something important. You understand? Yeah. Any positive role models in your life growing up then? Well, unfortunately, the role models that I had, as I said, were armed robbers and stuff like that. So those kind of people, you know, you think they're role models and you think they're positive, but they're not really, are they? Because they're not going to be able to teach you anything what won't lend, like, lead you to prison. So whatever you think they're teaching you what's good, it's not really good because it's not really going to help you in real life times. Yeah. It's going to lead you into problems. You get me? Well, you're just young and impressionable so, at that age, isn't it? When you're looking up at people like that and you think, man, it's big and clever, not realising. That's right. You get me? And that's why all them kind of people nowadays, I don't, I don't respect them because they know the truth. You get me? Enough of them don't want to go prison themselves and they'll yeah. happily push someone else in front and sell someone else a, a, a dream what they know is not true just so they can get what they need done done and sit in the background you understand i don't i don't respect that no more go and do your own fucking dirty work and fucking risk prison yeah or get a form of yourself you understand and that's why no one can't tell me anything because i've managed to come into society and find a formula for myself what works, what's honourable, what doesn't involve anything underhand or dis... You understand? Yeah. Dusting on anybody else's life or anything is clean. You understand? And it helps other people. So I'm, I'm on the right track. And people should be able to take a leaf from, from that. Because yeah. that's what you generally need to do if you want to survive. You need to have a profession what people can relate to, what can help other people or, you know, sustain yourself in a decent way and then you're on the right track. Yeah. So going back to when you were like 13 and you started getting into trouble, were you in school at this time? I left school at around that time, to be honest, 13. I was in, by the time I went to secondary school, I left school, yeah. Uh, Henry Fulton, Clapham Common. Miss Noble, Mr. Noble, the Ed Masters, African <coughs> Ed Master. Very, very strict, love to cane people's children. <laughs> but he's smart because he asks the permission first and the parents always say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, because you know them old-fashioned pay people. Yeah. And then this man just pull out the cane and just whap you on your hand with it. Get me? <laughs> Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah, I got cane. When I got cane after that, I never went back. You never went back after that? Nah, 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 nah. So <laughs> I, couldn't believe my nan, I couldn't believe my nan said yes. <laughs> 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 and then once you don't go to school, after that, you're just on a road to, to, to nowhere, aren't you? So a little bit after that, I went to prison for the first time. So that's what I was going to get to. When was the, um, like, when did you first get into trouble with the police? Right, I was getting in trouble all, a little times throughout that period, but not going to prison. I was going to police station, police station. But then when I was 14, I went to prison. I went to detention centre, four months detention centre. And it was very, it was a shock. Walking, send. It, was, it wasn't a nice experience. I can imagine that 14-year-old going into a, a detention centre. It's just like a prison, isn't it? So... Yeah, it's worse because they, they, listen, it was worse. That they, they, they had some vicious staff there, bro. And a night man called Chips. I know he's not still alive, but he, brother, he was a disgusting man. Our human being could be like that to kids. Yeah, it says a lot. You understand? He'd have you up all night, bring you to the bars, and pull you through the bars and chip you on. That's why they call him Chips. Chip your face off on the bar. You understand? Uh -huh. And make you run up and down in the corridor, make bed packs all night. So by the time morning time, you're knackered. And then seven o'clock, the bell's got an alarm and you have to get up and you're on this regime again, like an army person. Do you understand? 
Where's it's, the other? It, it's basically torture, brother. Basically, it was basically torture. And it wasn't nice at all. But it didn't change me because I came out fitter and more athletic and more serious. And if that don't change you, nothing would change you. Like, there was this guy there, yeah? He was just broken, this black kid. And all he used to say was he don't care what happens because he's not coming back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I bet you he never, I bet you he never, because that, that he had conviction. <laughs> he had conviction, <laughs> you understand? He said he's not coming back. And he, uh, you understand? Yeah, he felt the pain. But me, I'm hard of hearing, in it? So it obviously wasn't enough. So you would have yeah, 25 years before it was enough. <laughs> so when you were in the detention centres, you probably would have met people like you knew from the streets that you were at CMH, did you? No, there wasn't, you know, because remember, it's all the way in Woking. Right, so you so were like outside of your area. All over the place. All, mostly white kids, to be honest, from all over the place. You understand? Local and everywhere else around London, I suppose. Because remember, Walking's on the outskirts of London on right, M25. Gotcha. So you can get people from everywhere, basically. And then there's one and two other black kids. You get me? So were you carrying weapons and stuff when you were on the streets at this age? On and off, but not really. I was just like thieving things, to be honest. And then after that four months, then I got another one. And then I got a six months. You see the spiral? Yeah, and getting bigger. It starts, it starts adding up. You get me? And then by the time I realized about weapons properly and what you could do and how it can benefit you, I was in my 20s, to be honest. And when I did get to realize that, I used it fully because it's psychological uh, benefits. And did you move on to more serious crime at this point then, when you got older? When I, as yeah, it just gradually got, it gradually just got more serious as it went on. So from street, you know, from petty thefts to breaking into cars, then to burglaries, then and street robberies. And then after it started getting into real burglaries, rich people's uh, things. Yeah. So when you see the difference of rich people and poor people, and I remember there was this guy, yeah, he was a taxi driver, yeah? And he lived in our old estate. And he said, he said, I won't say his name, but I know he must be passed away by now, but he was a good man. You get me? He was a good man. He always just joke with the kids and buy us ice cream and all that. And he knew me from when I was a kid. And when he saw me getting rude and naughty and burgling and all that, he said, listen, never shit on your own doorstep. That's what he told me. Yeah. You understand? And I went home and and analyze his words and worked it out what he was saying. Yeah. And then we just said, right, we just got one of our artists to rent a car and we put the cushion on the seat and we're too small to drive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Right. We hit the motorway, you understand? M25, all around stockbroker's belt. And we just started okay. smashing all around the stockbroker's belt and it was a difference straight away. You understand? Because every time you, you go out there, you're coming back with foreign money English money Rolex yeah. all, at first we didn't even analyse that we didn't even know the value of some of them stuff you get me one guy we bought some stuff to him and he had a little jewellers and then I'm not joking he gave us £1,100 and we felt like we were millionaires and that was peanuts to what he got okay. because then next like two three weeks later the shop moved from that little shop to some big jewellers next door I'm not joking <laughs> <laughs> like it, like he made the bag from what we bought him. You get me? <laughs> so that's what that's what was going on at that stage. Just like not you know, when you're young you don't understand the value of things. Yeah. So when did you first come into contact with guns? So then that was because of this same stockbroker's belt scenario. That's how you could end up with a shotgun and stuff like that now from the burglaries and then that's how we started to realize the power of them things like once i pulled pulled i got one and i pulled it on my cousin and when i saw the reaction and how he you know he was terrified i said yes this is the one you understand 
because all you have to do, yeah, is use this now, and everyone's gonna lean your way, <clears throat> and especially if you don't talk a lot. And you understand? Use the rest of your psychological powers to if to add that with it. People are gonna go along with your argument, and it and it worked. It did, everyone. But it's a it's a short journey. It's a short. You might feel invincible. You might you will feel invincible, and you'll feel on top of the world, and everything's going your way. But it's a short lived process. In other words, it's not gonna last more than five years. If you're some super gangster and you got all of the criminal fraternity underneath you and you're going to eat from them you might last longer if that makes sense yeah the thing the other day with the, the little girl who got murdered in liverpool yeah that that person took so long to get unraveled yeah because they're in some elite pocket of criminality in society you understand what i'm saying yeah they're not really exposed to everything so if you're one of them kind of people you might last longer but ultimately you're gonna go to jail because something's gonna come along where you have to do something what you didn't plan and it's gonna unravel everything else if that makes sense well it only ends two ways doesn't it? that sort of lifestyle either in that's prison or dead and that's it and it's the truth and there's no other quick fix to life that's what you need to understand. And any shortcuts won't be manifesting into anything where you can wake up, walk your dogs, drive your car, enjoy yourself day in, day out until God's ready for you. You understand? Yeah. That's what young people need to understand really more than anything else. Going back to like your late teen years and 20s when you were into this serious trouble, what the... Um... Were you carrying a gun with you all the time, like a daily thing? Right. So once I got to the gun stage, then eventually we we got we got some handguns, and once we got them, I was walking with it every day until I got comfortable. And then after that, I didn't want. There was no time when I wouldn't have nothing on me because if I didn't have it, I felt uncomfortable. If you understand what I mean, yeah, because you're used to it so much, and then from there, started going to Jamaica, started realizing that coke was cheap compared to England, dirt cheap, and then just got into that coke game and started making some serious money. But the gun was always in, enforcing everything, yeah. so you're gonna always have problems because every time when you're shooting there and there and there. Them shootings are getting, some of them must get reported back to Scotland Yard or must get reported back to police along the way. Go to a nightclub, fire up some shots, little shells are on the floor. They tell a story, you get me? Holes in the ceiling, they tell a story. Yeah. So it just builds up, builds, builds, and in the end, it's going to lead to your own downfall. You understand what I mean? Yeah. And you can pick up the shells as you go along as much as you want, but it's not going to stop the ultimate end result. And that's the truth. So leading up to the, the crime that you got your big sentence for, what happened round about that time? Because I've, obviously I've read about it. I met you in front and stuff. I know a little bit about it. But you shot two police officers, didn't you? Yeah, so that was the peak of all of my madness, that little section, yeah. And basically, I just got to the stage where... I got arrested for armed robbery. I went on remand and I escaped from prison. Right. So when I escaped from prison now, that put me onto a different level because I'm going against the system, against society, against everything. And I'm on telly now for being a wanted for escaping from prison and armed robbery and firearms, everything. So now I'm fully bad. And I just embraced it, basically. And just I started criming and as I said Jamaica uh, coke and started making money like that and just living my life basically and then because uh, the thing happened in London with the police 
I left, went to Holland, then then uh, to Jamaica, and then ultimately I went back. I went to America and I settled down over there. <clears throat> and then some other stuff happened over there, and that's how I got unravelled. So basically, I got arrested by an FBI SWAT team, and they uh, arrested me with a Mac 11 in my waist. And then they went back to my house and found a Glock in the kitchen and, like, I don't know, 30 key of weed or whatever it was and a couple key of coke. Yeah. So they said that my house was a drugs factory and they gave me some million-dollar bail bonds to make sure that I couldn't go nowhere. And they gave me an immigration sticker. So that means that I'm on false papers. I've been flying on a false passport. You get me? So even if I pull up the million dollars like the bail bond, I still can't be released because of the immigration sticker. So yeah. they know what they're doing. Understand? They're making sure you don't get released. And then the other girls and stuff that was in the house, they made deals with them all to talk and to do whatever. And then that's that was the end of me. I got I got uh brought back to London. To so, the- just to break that down a little bit there, Leroy, because obviously we went a bit quick through that process there. Yeah. Just obviously, after you've shot the two policemen, were you wanted for two attempted murders at that point? Yeah, yeah. I was wanted by Interpol. So then I, w- I was on a false passport so I could still travel. So I went to Holland the next day and then moved, moved to America and settled down over there. Did you go and to then, Jamaica first, did you see as well? No, when Jamaica was like where I'd been going on and off before the shooting happened. You got your, yeah. But I couldn't go back there at that time because there was some other things going on over there. You get me? Someone basically tried to rob me and they, they got, they got, I don't know, they got ironed out, I, I presume. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that made a bit of a, bit of a stink. You understand what I mean? Right, yeah. So, in Jamaica, you don't want to be about when there's that kind of stink because anything can happen. It don't matter that you're a foreigner or nothing. You understand? Yeah. <laughs> so America is the closest thing to England at that point. Well, did you have any connections in America? How come you ended up there? Yeah, no, because obviously the Jamaicans were ours within Jamaica. They right. got people everywhere. So I went around some Jamaicans in, in America <laughs> and they were like straight killers straight killers and they was in beef with some other Jamaicans. The first day I got there, yeah, they took me to this restaurant and they showed me an X on the floor and they said, listen, the last man what came here to link us and was parring with us like you, yeah, he came and the enemy saw him with us, yeah, and the next day he came to this shop to buy some food on his own and they saw him on his own and killed him. That's the X to mark the spot. That's the story, you are, what I got told. Do you understand? <laughs> Imagine that, and then they're telling me how how the war's been going, and how this man here, and he pointed, they pointed to one next yard, you yeah, and he shot off one of the man them's ears with the AK. He thought that he shot off his head, but it's just his ears. He went sideways and shot off his ears, yeah. And they was at home celebrating, thinking the man's dead. <clears throat> that time is his ears what they shot off, right? <laughs> and he's not dead. You understand? All them experiences, yeah. So it was like intense. When you're raving, you go party, it's police on the door in Connecticut. Cops are on the door because that's how everyone's got gone. Everyone's got gone. Yeah. You understand? So it's a very serious environment. And that's the environment what I went into. And yeah, it never ended up well. So how long were you over there for in America? Whereabouts in America about was it, did you say? About six months or so. And where was this? Connecticut. Connecticut, yeah. Yeah, Bridgeport, Connecticut. So did you get, when you got arrested over there, what prison was it? Was it like a whole I prison? I went, I, went, I went to Bridgeport Correctional Centre. Right. And it was a scary experience, and I'm a, and I'm a serious person. I'm not like Sean Atwood, what tells you that he's on the highest security with the brother in the Aryan Woods and all <laughs> these killers, and he just you know, held his own. And done all his bird on on the main. No, brother. It was a scary experience. And if I never had the, the Jamaicans around me, who we were killers <clears throat> and had their res- reputation and respect, I would have been in trouble. Yeah, yes, no, brother. 
that's the real talk right there, brother. You get me? So, yeah, that was my experience. Well, how so, long did they keep you there? I was there for about about five months. Right. About <laughs> five months. It wasn't nice. And then after that, the aeroplane come for me and took me back to London. And I went uh, to Belmarsh, double cat A. Belmarsh is a rough prison as well, isn't it? Yeah, but I was in the in the unit, so it was like yeah. it's a bit different because IRA, Colombians, big big hitters in there. You get me, and yeah. everything's decent and everyone's respectable, and we res got respect for each other. It's not like on the main yeah. Belmar uh, house blocks where everyone's for everyone's for each everybody for yourself, everybody for themselves. You get me? So like in the high security and, prisons, I see them. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. that was the problem. And what sentence did you end up getting then? So basically I got I got sixty I got sixty 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 seven years and uh it was like twenty five years for shooting one of the officers in the back, yeah. That's the attempted murder charge, yeah. And that's the officer ironically now that me and him is friends. Yeah. So bizarre. Yeah. So that officer there, 25 years, and the other officer what got shot in his leg, I got 18 years, but it's run concurrent. Concurrent. And I got 14 years for for an armed robbery on a jeweler's, and then I got five years for an unlawful shooting, and two years for escaping from prison. So, yeah, that's what happened. The well, luckily it ran concurrent and not consecutive. <laughs> yeah, I would never have got out. <laughs> Yeah, I would never have got out. So yeah, that's what happened. So then that's when you met me in 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 the high security estate. What year did you get sentenced? Uh, Nineteen ninety-five. Ninety-five. So it was obviously when I met you, you must have been in like eleven years. Yeah. It was two thousand and six yeah. in Franklin. So yeah. where did you go from Belmarsh when you first got sentenced? Where did you I go? Went, I went to Fort Sutton first, and then I just went on a roundabout, round and round and round. The same four prisons until you have done all the high security prisons. <laughs> yeah, round and round until you met me. Was that your first time in front <laughs> you? No, I've been there a few times. Because remember, <laughs> I'm I'm double cat A. Yeah. You can only go round and round to them four prisons. So I never stayed in one prison for more than eighteen months at any one time. So I ended up being in each prison like six, seven times before I came out. So what was there? What was Franklin prison like compared to the other prisons? Because obviously Franklin being further up north. Back in the day when I first went to Franklin, it was racist as fuck. <laughs> you understand? Yeah, and it's only because of certain man like the Sayers is some Judy proper Judies. You get me? And Andy Adams back then, and certain Judies what came down south what knew the thing. You understand? Yeah. So they used to say, yeah, why, man, you, away, you can't deal with the man them like that. You understand? Because yeah. them some of them Judies, yeah, and, oh, yeah, man, like, Bud and them, man, they, they, they would, like, say to them, nah, because some of them Judies be like, how oh, yeah, rubber lips, and I'll bite your <laughs> nose off and all this. Yeah. Black bastard, Raji, all of this, yeah, all of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. That. <laughs> yeah, I love them to death now, though, but, yeah, all of that. <laughs> We had to get some real male bonding going on for the last yeah. 10 years before, <laughs> before you understand? Now they understand better. You get me? Yeah. So it was yeah. an experience. Obviously, when I was in there in 2006, it wasn't really, wasn't like nah, that. Nah, man. Yeah, before you got there. I'm telling you about 10 years before that. Yeah. I... When it was down at the bottom end. When it was yeah. the old old building. Old wings, I. Yeah. That's what I'm telling you about, bro. It was murders down there, bro. Murders. You get me? Like different world every day, you get me. But it was an experience, you get me. Yeah. Which was, was the worst? Yeah. Which was the worst out of the high security prisons back then? They're all just as bad. They all got oh, their oh, good oh, points. Oh. All their bad points. Yeah. That it's hard to say which is outright the worst. You get me? Because you might go to one and it ain't got much drugs, but it's got phones. Yeah. Or you might go to another one and it ain't got much phones, but it's got drugs. You understand? Yeah. It depends. And it depends who you are and who you go around. You understand? So it's one of them scenarios.
and what you like doing. Like with you, you a man go to the gym and that's it. Don't matter where you go, does it? <laughs> really? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. As long as you got gym and food, you're nice, isn't you? Yeah. That's basically the gist of it, brother. And there are obviously a lot of people don't realize in them Cartier high security prisons just how dangerous it actually is every day. If you step out of line, you're going yeah. to get seriously hurt, aren't you? <laughs> right now, listen, this is the thing why it makes me laugh because these people ain't got a clue, yeah? And they swear that they're the man and they swear this and this and that, yeah? And I've seen them go to this person and get stabbed to bits and have to change their own, their whole outlook to life. Yeah. Come out in the morning after you go and get your stitches, come out like a new man. <laughs> Understand? <laughs> fully, fully, fully changed all your bad ways, gone from you. Stabbed out and smashed out of you. Do you understand? Yeah. The hard road, the easy way. And I've seen it with my own eyes, brother. And I've 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 diced up a whole heap of people in there and I've had it done to me. So I know how yeah. it is in there. Get me? <laughs> not no joke whatsoever. It's nothing funny in there. Oh. And if you're not about all of that, best you don't go there. Because it's not a place you're gonna come there with some smiling weasel face. <laughs> yeah. And just smile your way through it. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. You understand? Well, if you don't it's present yourself, like, if you don't yeah. present yourself properly in there, and you disrespect. Yeah. First thing, <laughs> man's gonna ask, "Who are you smiling at, brother?" It's something funny. You understand? <laughs> That's the first thing man's gonna ask. Yeah? yeah, and then straight away, if you can't back that up with something sensible to say, yeah, oh, your hands dead. What are you gonna do? Smile some more, say no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Look at the bright side. It's a nice day. <laughs> you <laughs> rascal, idiot. You understand? It ain't going to work. Man's no. going to know because it's just like you can't hide nothing. You can't. You can't, There's nowhere to hide. And yeah. man's watching and analysing everything about you. <laughs> it's like having a dog. Like my dog is an Akita. It's like a wolf. It can sense everything. So if I had that dog now and I was scared of that dog, he would know that I'm scared of him. Yeah. And then he would start acting up because he can sense it. That's the same kind of thing about dispersal. People can sense like everything and read into things quick because it's that kind of environment. It's, you can't put your hands on it. It's hard to explain. You have to go there to really experience and see what I'm talking about. But you know what I'm talking yeah. about. And when it kicks off, when it goes off, the tension on the wings are unbearable. It's unreal, isn't it? Yeah, because <laughs> everyone has to see whose sides you're gonna go on yeah. and what's gonna happen next. <laughs> and you've got to you've got to know what you're doing. Remember when there was that riot thing in, in Franklin, yeah, with Slaney and all that, yeah. I remember. And I remember. then after all of the black people was gone, and the only one that was left was Zebby. <laughs> 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 but because Zebby's cool with everybody, white, black, pink, everybody. He had nothing to hide. His heart was clean. So he said he's not going nowhere. <laughs> and nothing ever happened to him. Yeah. Nothing ever happened to him. Because all them white guys, they're like, it's Zebby, man. Uh, you understand? It would have been hard for them to put their hand on him. You get me? The respect was there. So that's what it is about, bro. Getting the respect, what you deserve, and showing what you're about. And man will remember that when the time comes. So did you ever, did you witness any murders in prison? No, I've been, I've, I've been about when a couple of things have happened, like when that guy got murdered in Long Larton for singing. And uh, I think I was in the block one time when someone got murdered in Full Sutton. And that one nonce one what got murdered down the block, yeah, in Full Sutton. He was a rapist, yeah. And he said he's going to hang himself. And everybody was like, hurry up. And he said, when I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. And we all laughed at him and said, you're not going to do it. And he did, he did it, he did it. You understand? Really? Yeah, he did it. So, like, good on him. Yeah. <laughs> Join his name was, I think. Was so, it, yeah, that, that was about it. And, uh, yeah, this other old guy, man. And he was a good guy, you know, and he just had enough. And he, put, he just hanged himself on a chair. Yeah, that was in full sight yeah. as well. So it's a sad place. It's a lot of things all mixed up in one. And some people, they're going to literally go there and die there. And they're never going to see daylight again. Like that old man, Ted, he died there in full sun. 
and the staff's laughing at him about he's dead. <laughs> and I'm saying, is that really so funny? So it's a lot of things all in one. And I'll reiterate, if you can't do the porridge yeah. and you're not about all of that, just leave it because it's not a game, bro. Like, well, going back to like the violence in prison and stuff when you said you've inflicted it on the people and it's happened to you as well. Have yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. What happened to you? Have you been stabbed up in prison? I've had all different kinds of scenarios happen. Do you understand? Yeah. And basically, yeah, as you know, is 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 touch and go do like I've had like I've had one guy, yeah, he he stuck it on me and I had to end up doing him something. You get me? And then after I was back in another prison again together. But we squashed it. You understand? So yeah. it could be any kind of scenario, but I've had both ways. But because them things are in the past and it's like none of them led to me locking up anyone or anyone locking up me, I'm going to just leave it like that. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Uh -huh. And just say that I've done it and I've had it done to me. Yeah. So I know what it's about. You get me? And I've seen it happen to loads of other people. Do you understand what I mean? And even in my book, I, I elaborated a little bit about the last time I had an altercation, and that was with that dread. Yeah, I just and even then I didn't say his name, I just said dirty dread. Yeah. So yeah. people know who it is I'm talking. Yeah. And he punched my mouth. And I took that L because I knew if I was to retaliate, I could risk myself a life sentence. And I only had two years, less than two years left to go home yeah if a man's doing life and you've only got less than two years to go home he could get spiteful and just make a statement just to keep you in prison forever Jesus. this is how deep it is so yeah i'm thankful to god that i made it through the through the the, the disgusting journey what it was and i'm just leaving all sleeping dogs to lie yeah so how many years did you spend in the cut years all together was it uh, for 17 years, uh, eight months. All of it, bro. All of it. Can't hear. <laughs> yeah, all of it. We went to the door of our station, dog. Where did you get released from? Which prison? From Belmarsh. From Belmarsh. Yeah. So what was what was that feeling like for you then, knowing that this was it? You were, you were coming to the end of your sentence. You were getting released. And who was it for you? It was amazing, bro. I think I bet. And when I got released, yeah, I got released, came out to my cousin in a brand new BMW with with a bag with fire agar and Durex and <laughs> a big bag of clothes shopping on the side, yeah. £500 in an envelope, a Rolex, everything, you understand? <laughs> it was nice. It was, it was really nice. And then after everything here, to write that book and have one of my victims, forgive me, yeah, is unbelievable. What that man done, yeah, has changed the whole dynamics of my life. Yeah. Because for a policeman, an ex-policeman, to forgive you for shooting him, that's unbelievable, brother. Couldn't make that up. You understand? So I'm blessed in lots of ways and I'm lucky and I'm making the most of my situation to highlight for other people. Do you understand what I mean? So did you have, obviously, when you've come out getting released, you've got a totally different mindset, everything you've been through? Well, to be honest, I, I did a little bit, but not enough. Yeah. Because, remember, I didn't get it right until 2014. Because you got recalled to prison, didn't you? Did you get That's a recall? Right. Yeah. That's, yeah, I got recalled for, for, for two years, bro. So, so that goes to show I wasn't fully in the right track. It's only when I come out in 2014 and I really knew that this is it. you got one chance and if you want to go to jail for the rest of your life, you make a wrong move now and that's what's going to happen. And then that's when I wrote the book and then that's when I got forgiven and then I've never looked back since and now it's going on nearly nine years. So the recall back to prison is the one that ultimately made you think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a recall. Yeah. I've experienced the recall myself. The recall... It's actually worse terrifying. than the sentence, isn't it? It's terrifying, brother. It's worse it's than actual nice. sentence, isn't it? Because you don't know when you get no together. Yeah. <clears throat> it's terrifying. It's not nice. And especially when you know you could get an, a new sentence. You get me? 
it's yeah. not nice. So all of these experiences is what led me to be the person I am today. Yeah. And I've got to take credit to 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 James, yeah, for what he did to forgive me, because really and truly, I don't know if I'll be able to forgive someone for shooting me. Do you understand? Yeah. So and that's made me look at a lot of other things different as well. You get me? Well, yeah. fair play and all respect to you for doing that because I, I know you go around schools and everything now and you're trying to educate the youth, aren't you? The North right. so now, like you went yeah. yeah, now I go to, I've been to Oxford University, a lot of university, city university, and basically I go to schools and cruise and I do talks with young people just to make them know the reality of life and so they don't end up on the wrong track, basically. And any other chance I get, I can I air it on interviews, on TV, on radio. Any chance I get, I'm always trying to do that because that's the most important thing. And I've worked with a, a gang-affiliated young people that came over from America. All sorts of things, always driving towards highlighting why you mustn't go on certain roads to lead yourself down a road where you're going to go to prison and... Yeah. Mess up your life. you'd be better off working in mcdonald's and that's basically the long and short of it as i said <clears throat> this is the book out of the box it's on amazon it's in waterstones it's easily available it's got five stars beside it and it's an extremely powerful read and my website out of the box book dot uk is a powerful website with a lot of mainstream content and then my tiktok Please, guys, give me a follow. Uh, out of the box book, Leroy Smith, yeah, TikTok, and then yeah. Well, what I'll do, I'll put all the links in the description so people that can would, click on it. Yeah, yeah. Keep, keep watching the space, and I'm waiting for a Netflix deal right now, so you'll be able to watch the whole story soon on your TV screens. Screens. It's just a matter of time, but that's definitely happening. So yeah. And on there on Wednesday at 9 p.m. on Channel 5 inside Franklin, me and Lee oh, yeah. the documentary, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, yeah. Channel 5. <laughs> yeah, big up Channel 5. <laughs> Elliot. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's all going on. And like, even Ricky, I've got to take my hat off to him because he's a real one. Follow his YouTube channel, innit? He's a real one, innit? He's not like one of these guys with, with their face smiling like a Ch Cheshire cat. Just using brain. Do you understand? He's genuine, innit? I can testify to that because I know him, innit? Yeah. You understand? And he puts in the hours. He's got his wife and his kids. Yeah. And he, and he's, what he says on the tin is what he is. And he puts in the hours. So full, full of rim. And, you know. Appreciate that, man. Yeah, he's a real one. You get me? And James English as well. I've done a podcast with him and he's, he's a good guy too. So I've got to talk it as it is. You get me? So, yeah. But I'm going to finish with one question, which I do on all my podcasts, is what would you say to the kids now that are going down the path that yourself and myself went down to try right. and... What I, would, yeah. what I would say, brother, is this. Try and get into social media to as a business, like doing Facebook ads or <clears throat> Instagram ads or any one of them, all of them together. Try get into cryptocurrency, even though I'm not no expert, but I can see that it's going to be the future. Try and, you know, save your own money. Gold coins, sovereigns, whatever, literal money in all different forms. Yeah. Try and go to university if you like education, because you can get to do certain things without putting your hand in your pocket. You don't have to pay for it yourself. Do you understand? Yeah. Don't be following no one talking about gang gang. That's all a myth. You're gonna go to prison. And no postcode don't belong to you. And if you got someone that's in your like say if you're already into gangs and you're already in a trap and you got one sister or one auntie or someone you trust and you're making money, give them, let them start a business. Try and change it around, change around the narrative, send money home to your indigenous country. To build a house, make a future for yourself. What's realistic, and if you're into the rap game, 
and you make it, bring in other people and make them make legal businesses to try and turn it around for a bigger picture. But don't sit down and think you're just going to be a rapper and you have to be one or you're going to be a footballer and you have to be one. Be realistic to your situation. And sometimes a means to an end is better than nothing. So you might go and get a work job, you know, a security guard job or even anything. Standard minimum wage is better than guy in prison, bro. And it's better than following the wrong people, searching for a dream that don't exist. You have to get up and do you. That's what I know. Go university or go around some new people as well. Get me? Go to some different kind of environments and events and meet new people from different circles. Because the more wider your social circle, the more chances are going to come your way, which will make a difference to your life. These are all factual things I'm telling you. So that's in general what I'll tell you. Be your own boss. Be your own man. Don't let no one just lead you down the garden path like a sucker until you go to prison. That's my advice. Yeah. Brilliant advice, mate. Well, Leroy, thanks very much for your time, mate. It's been a pleasure. No problem, mate. All right, cheers. Bye.